Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unit Master's six weeks program to upskill you for the new economy. In today's crypto workshop coaching session, we have Zep. Zep is based in Vietnam and he's the head of research at Kyber Capital. And he's going to run us through a hands on workshop on how can you actually systematically look through um, through different projects and then see you know which ones are kind of the noisy ones and which ones have a little bit of fundamental value behind them but that's gonna share or run us through the um the, the process of the framework in a structured way he has actually built up a very exhaustive d y o r a wiki and i hope zeb you're going to share that with us too i found this a, a very enriching resource for for understanding the market in more detail so stage is all yours. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, indeed, I will. You are already giving away a little bit of a surprise, but yes, I will, don't worry. So yeah, uh, let's see if I'm allowed to share the screen and I will start off. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So yeah, today, indeed, we are going to talk about doing your own research or as in crypto, as they say, um, D-Y-O-R. And let me get the chat also there so I can see what's happening. All right, here we go. Now, today, indeed, we will uh, do a bunch of things. We will do a workshop with, oh, wait. We'll do a workshop about doing your own research. And I also have a little bit of a bonus due to some recent events that happened that made also security a little bit more pressing. So first, let's start it off. So indeed, I work with Cyber Capital, which is one of the oldest crypto funds in Europe. I am the head of research there, so I do research. But this today is not financial advice, I would say, even though I am from a crypto fund, because what is really the point of today is that you will do your own research. So what I want to give today is some tips and tools to help you do your own thing. Because even though I work for a fund, I think one of the cool things of crypto is that it's all out in the open and that people can do uh, their own things and verify themselves what they want to look into. So first things first, today is more of a sneak peek into do your own research. So from what I understand is that this is more of a mentor session. And I also understand that most people who came to this session are really from a wide range of an audience, like young, old, very deep into crypto to basic beginners. So I will try to use simple language for pressing and important topics. And um, Today is indeed more of a, a tool, so tips that can help you evaluate certain projects or assets, tokens that you find interesting and that you want to look into a little bit more. And then I'm going to give you a couple of things that you can use for that. That is not to say that if the things that I tell you today, if your token or your project that you want to evaluate, it passes all of these, that it's automatically a good one. And it also doesn't mean that if it doesn't pass, it's a bad project. But I do think that this can help to have an initial idea. And I think it will be able to help you to evaluate. And then the thing is, there's always more to learn. So not only for you tonight, but also for me. And I think that's why today will be more of a sneak peek. I also do give bigger and longer workshops. They like can be more formal, more informal. They can be bigger. They can be more in-depth or more basic. So today will really be more of a, a tryout to see what do your own research can be like. So what is the game plan for today? Today, we are going to go through a couple of research questions, not too much because I think otherwise it can be overwhelming. So I chose four main questions that we are going to look at that can help you evaluate. Then we're going to try it out live immediately because I believe that people learn well by doing. So then it is the time that it will ask 
people in, uh, in this session to tell me a project that they might have heard of or that they want to try out with these questions, and we will do it together. Then after that, we will learn about a helpful tool, which we will try out live immediately after again as well. And then we will do a recap to really remember what we have learned today. And then we will have the bonus tips and tools around security. And we end it off with a question and answers. So here we go. The four questions of today. The first one that we will look at is, is the service or the product live on mainnet? Now, what does mainnet mean? So you have in crypto, they have two terms. One is called testnet and one is called mainnet. Testnet is like a blockchain, but it is to test. So there is no real value being transacted on that net. And mainnet means people are really sending real value, real money, and are interacting with real live smart contracts. So uh, let me... Oh. I have too much things in my screen, yes. So one of the ways to do that, to check, is to go to a website of the project that you like, and then maybe you see something like here with connect wallet. When you have something that says connect wallet, it means that you can really interact with your wallet directly with the blockchain. So that's usually a sign of something being live. Now, other projects, they might have that they say, Ah, all right, I already see a question. What is the difference between mainnet and network? Good question. So network is a very broad term. Network can mean a, that is used in relationship to blockchains, but also to projects built on top of blockchains. And I mean, a network can also just be a group of people emailing together. So it really is like a group of uh, users connecting and mainnet is that you are on a blockchain that is live, so that you are transacting with real value. For instance, Ethereum mainnet, then you are using real Ethereum to send to other users. Um, and I think the coin should be tested first in testnet, then go live in mainnet. Exactly, that is indeed what you want. So if you see connect wallet, it usually means mainnet unless they really say explicitly that it is on a testnet but usually this is a sign that it is live now you can also see things like this this is from not ethereum but terra luna which is also a blockchain and there you have download the station wallet and sometimes oh no and that's yeah two ways to find out if it's live now um Another question that is really important, in my opinion, is what is the initial token allocation? Initial means from the starting point, and allocation means how it is distributed. Now, why is this an important question? Well, distribution is one of the main things that make decentralization and blockchains interesting. So let's go a little bit more deeper into that token allocations. So why are they important? When a blockchain um, is on mainnet and has started, people can start to interact with tokens. And often who has a certain amount of tokens means that they can also do things with the blockchain itself. So it is about control. And what do I mean with that? is that a lot of these projects have governance on the blockchain and token holders, they can vote. So if you have only three people with tokens, then it's not very decentralized. It would be more towards centralization. If you have, let's say 3000 token holders, then you have a way more decentralized distribution as they say. So for instance, uh, blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can sit, look at their block explorers. So look into the blockchain and see how many token holders there are. And it's really in the thousands. We even have millions of addresses now. But a token allocation from the start is that you look at 
the team, what did they give away to which parties? So let's look at some examples of this. So you are looking into a new project and you're like, oh, let's see at these token allocations because Zev says this is important. Now, what could you find there? For instance, you can find a typical allocation of team or a dev developer allocation or the foundation allocation. So this is a part of the tokens that is going towards the people who have created the project. I think that this is definitely important that they get tokens because it means they have what you call skin in the game. They have a reason to make this a successful project because their tokens will become more valuable. Now, another one is, for instance, pre-sale, private sale investors or advisors. So this is also a smaller group of people usually who help out the project, either by funding them or by helping them strategically. Now, there is a big debate currently going on in the blockchain world of, is this still up to date? Do you still need private sales? Yes or no? Of course, the investors, the private investors say yes, because we bring in a lot of expertise and a lot of network. We can give you uh, new intros to other people who might be important for your project. So this is also a allocation that you often see. A third one is what is often called the public sale or the ICO, or you see community rewards or something called liquidity mining or airdrops. All of these are more towards the larger community. So it's open to anyone to participate. Now, personally, I like these allocations to be the biggest because I think if everyone can participate, you have an open network and you have the largest or the biggest chance to get a decentralized network. And then the last one that you might see is a treasury or community fund. Now, what does this mean? This means a section of tokens that they set aside that the above three are able to vote on. So then uh, later on, when the project is live, they can vote, let's say, let's use some of these tokens for marketing, or let's use some of it for other development teams. So you don't have one team developing, you have multiple. So you also have decentralization within different developing teams working on it. And this one, in the last year has really grown because decentralized governance in the last year has become more of a thing. Something I will also talk about next week in my talk about DAOs, because DAOs are really at the core of this allocation. Let's look at some examples. So, oh, I'm doing the chat. So here you see foundation reserve, pre-sale and public ICO. So you might think like, okay, so one third to the team, one third to private sale, one third to public ICO. That's great, right? Everyone a little bit of a balance, but you have to remember that the team and the private sale, it's just a bunch of people and you want the tokens to be distributed in as many people as possible to have it secured for the future. So I would say this is still a bit too little on the side towards the public. Now you also have the other side of the spectrum, like extremely towards the community. What you see here is the token distribution of Mirror Protocol, a project built on Luna. And they send two thirds to a community pool. So that's the treasury for later. And 16% to an airdrop and six uh, to Uniswap uh, traders. So people who used a different project. So they're like, let's say, uh, let's use, no, let's airdrop to users to give it into the hands of people who actually will use this. And then you have Luna stakers who got an airdrop. Those are people who are doing like staking is something like mining to secure the whole network of Luna. So they thought that's also a group of people we want to give it to. Now, Karen, I see, did you say mirror XYZ? I believe that's a different project. I think they have Mirror Protocol, but don't pin me on that. There are three different projects called Mirror right now. So that is, it's getting confusing. Yeah. 
But I would say here with this token distribution that we see here, it's again a bit on the extreme side because there's nothing to the team, nothing at all. So I think in the long run, probably the community will vote to give the team some tokens to keep on developing. But this is a risk that you're taking here. So a balance in the end, obviously, is the best. Um, all right. Uh, ah, yes, of course. Where to find these? Because, hey, you're going to do your own research. So how can you find out about these things? Now, there are different websites that help out with this. Obviously, the first thing is hopefully the website of the project itself. The more transparent they are, the better. So in their documentation or on their website, they should share this with you. But if they don't, then you have things like Masari. They often do so. And you have things like Binance Research, which also shares token distributions often. And we have CoinMarketCap, which also gives information. And the last one is, of course, to Google. Because if you just type in project name plus token allocation or coin distribution, you often get this information. Now, if you might think like, oh, Masari, Binance, I have to remember this. I will share these slides later on in the chat. So don't worry. You can just check all of those kind of details later. Plus, I believe this is going to be shared as a recording. So don't worry if it goes too fast to take notes. Now, the third question is, is the code public on GitHub? What does that mean? Well, these projects, they work with um, they work with smart contracts on blockchains and these smart contracts they are built up of code and if the code is public it means it's open for everyone to look at it so it's instead of closed source open source as they say and i think projects who indeed open source their code they really get a big plus in my book so how can we find this? Well, on websites, sometimes you have on the project website, you have something like this, where they say uh, here, just immediately link to their GitHub. So that's the best way, obviously. Very clear right there on their website. Other websites, they don't. They have maybe in their docs, they have their GitHub. So then it's a little bit more searching. And then some websites just don't at all. Like this one is from uh, Shiba Inu, the meme coin, and they do not have their code public. Basically, if you send it to send any transaction to their project, you send it to a black hole and you have no idea what's happening there. So let me show you how it would look like if you go to the GitHub, because the GitHub sounds already a little bit more technical. And here you see how it would look like. Now, it is more technical, but... Even for beginners, we have something that you can look at. And that's not necessarily right into the contract. I mean, if you want to, go for it. That's the power of open source. But look here, we have stars and forks. If a GitHub has a lot of stars, it means that, well, a lot of developers think that this is good code. Obviously, this could be gamed. People could make fake accounts, but still, I mean, if you see a project with zero stars, well, it's a different story than one like this of Aave, a well-known DeFi protocol with 800 stars. And forks means that people have copied the code. So they think that the code is so strong, they want to use it. So that's also a good sign. Then the fourth question is, is the team anonymous? Now, you might say, wait a minute, Satoshi Nakamoto was anonymous. Why is this an important thing? Well, with Bitcoin, it is live already for a long time. The token distribution was basically all tokens to new mining, so nothing to private seal or the team. The code is definitely open source, so they have three out of four already that are really good. So then if the team is anonymous, there's less of an issue when it comes to trust because the code is public, you know, not they don't have a huge token allocation and you know that it's been live. But let's say your project that you're looking at has uh, been live, but the token distribution is unclear or is really towards the team. 
and the code is not public, well, then if the team is anonymous, then you're basically just sending to a stranger. You're sending your money to a stranger and hoping they will do well. And that is not what blockchain is about. Blockchain is about open sourceness and that you can really check if things are clear. So the anonymous thing is not a must, but it is in these days a good plus. Now, where can you find this? Again, hopefully on the team page, uh, I mean the project page, they might have an about section or a team section. Otherwise, you could just Google like the project name plus founder and see if they're public. And another way is to look in their documentation. Maybe there they also have some team information. So, okay, this is the, the four main questions. And we have one bonus question. Now, this bonus question is a bit further and in depth. We won't do it today, but it's really important. So I do want to mention it. And it's something that you have to decide yourself. And that is, does this use case make sense? I mean, before you start investing or using a project, you have to think for yourself, like, is this really needed with a blockchain? So there are structured ways to look at this. We won't go through it today. It's a bit too long, but you can look at it later. This is something you have to decide for yourself. So, okay, now we have tryout time, but first I see a question about the previous uh, research questions I gave, and that is what would be a good token allocation for a new project from my point of view? And that is a very good question. I think it depends if it is a blockchain layer one, which really needs to be as decentralized as possible, or if it's a DAP build on top. I generally speaking have more of a, um, I'm an more open-minded when it comes to DAPs because these are really more applications, but when it's blockchains, I would say, the largest allocation as possible to the community with mining or staking or liquidity mining or airdrops. And when it comes to dApps, I would say at least 50% of the tokens should not be within the hands of the team and private investors. Because otherwise they have more than 50% and they can sway, they can move every vote and they can just do what they want. And then it's not decentralized. So that's my personal uh, view on that. So it's tryout time. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to ask the group to just name a project and we're going to go through the four questions and see if we can quickly answer them. So anyone, please just uh, yeah, mention a project in the chat that you would like me to live demonstrate our four questions with. Ave, all right, there we go. Ah, uh, Mohammed, you were just too late. I think we're going to go for Ave this time. Let's see. I will, uh, uh, let's see here. We're going to do it. So who remembers the first question? Yip, do you remember the first question? Oh no, she forgot. That's fine. The first question is, is it live on mainnet? So let's look at Ave. Uh, Ave protocol. Let's go there. Here we go. You see, I've been on that website before. Sorry. Uh, let's see. We're here. Enter app. There you go. So remember, mainnet or testnet. So let's see. If we go here, can we enter? It needs some time of loading. What is here? Connect. There you go. Yes, you can connect to Aave. It's even version two, it says over here. So yes, we can connect to Ave. It is on mainnet. Good. Then what is the second question? Who knows? Who remembers the second question? Maybe, yep, maybe you remember this time. Oh no, she doesn't, but that's fine. Token allocation. Very good, Eleanor. Very good. So here, let's see with Ave uh, the token allocation. Ave uh, token allocation. Let's just Google it and see what it says. Good, Mohammed, you remembered as well. Very good. Uh, open, let's see where we see here. Avonomics token and governance upgrade. So here we see token economics. We're gonna just scroll down, see where they have. Uh, it's not here, not in this one. Well, let's see about the team pay or the website itself. Or maybe I have to do 
the coin distribution. Remember that also sometimes was the right way to look at this. So here we go into documentation, as you see. So let's see, where do we see something about tokens? We see governance, introduction. Maybe we can Google or search the token. Mm -mm -mm. Additional, ah, the white paper, always also another good source of information, obviously. So this white paper, let's see if this is the newest version one. Mm -hmm. Let's see the abstract. Let's see if we have something here about token distribution. Don't see it here immediately. Now, the thing is, we will see this later, by the way, with the tool, but that's cheating. We're going too fast then. So Aave coin distribution. And by the way, seeing that this for Aave is already a little bit difficult, that is not so good of them. They should make this way more easy. Hey, look who's there. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that later, the do your own crypto research. Let's see if CoinMarket has it. If not, then we should say that, okay, perhaps with looking further, we would be able to find it, but it's not very clear immediately. So for a large project like Aave, that is not amazing. So here we do see the total supply of 16 million. That is there, but they don't say how it has been um, distributed. We'll do one more, and that is Masari. There we go. Oh, someone already has it in the, the chat. Ah, can I see it, the chat? Yeah, there you go. Very good, Victoria. Let me just open yours. Boom, there we go. Yes, we all do it together. Here you go, perfect. Okay, so what do we see? We see 30% of core development, that is the team. We see uh, marketing, mar management and legal. I would say that's also the team in the end. Uh, or is this all, ah, this is the SIL. The ICO proceeds. That's not a total supply, the initial supply. Here we go. So investors, now the question is, was this private or was this public? Now we can see it was a crowd sale, so that is public. So they passed the test, I would say. They have three-fourths going to the public. All right, what's the next question? Third question. Who knows? Yes, open source code or not. Very good. Well done. Let's see if we have the GitHub here. Yes, we do. And of course we already know because it was in my presentation. So yes, we have with the stars a little bit more than first time on GitHub. Yep, so you can also just do search here but you never know if you get the right project that way. So I would highly suggest doing it through the website. And what is the last question? Who remembers? Last question. Anyone, the fourth question. Yes, is it anonymous or not? Now, the thing is with Aave is that they have become quite a well-known project. And what I've noticed is when they reach above a billion, they don't really do team on their page anymore. So it's an interesting thing. They seem like they are too big for this. So what we could see is like, is there some way of here, contact or whatever? Nah. Not very open. So let's do it like this. Ave founder. And there you are immediately. Stani. He's quite well known in the community. So we can say, no, they are not anonymous. And there you have it. The four questions there. Okay, let's move back on the road. So we tried out one. Then we have do your own research, a helpful tool. So this is a pet project of mine. You can scan the code there or go to the website. And what it is, is a like a wiki and it aggregates information. Ah, the bonus question. Yeah, well, we don't really have time for that one today, Vikas, but with Aave, it is lending. And I would say that lending with a decentralized money is quite a good use case. I mean, there are a lot of projects doing it right now, but yes, it is quite a good use case. Thank you for the link also in the chat. So yeah, the, do your own research. It aggregates information. So it takes information that is public and everywhere uh, to be found. It's not 
closed information, then what else it does? It always provides sources. So I try and the other people from the community of this wiki to do as minimal as possible of opinion. It is really more of a wiki. And the idea is that blockchain is all about the freedom of choice and do your own research gives you the tool to explore over 3000 pages worth of crypto uh, information. So this is how it looks if you get there. It is just a wiki and it goes into coins and tokens to companies to like uh, different uh, terms that people use in crypto and to people. And let's try it out. Let's try out what that looks like. So if a service is live on mainnet, here we look at Uniswap, where if you go to the Uniswap page on uh, the wiki here, you see started and mainnet launch. So it has been live for more than two years now. The token distribution. Well, if you look at Uniswap, you can see 60% to community members and 40% to investors and team members. I would say that passes the checklist. Then is the code public on GitHub? Well, there is a section called tech and there you see code can be viewed here. So yes, with Uniswap, they have code open. Is the team anonymous? Then you scroll down to team and here you see Hayden Adams as founder. So also here, Uniswap scores. Now let's try uh, one more with the do your own research crypto wiki. Let me scroll up to see who else had, or maybe someone else has a new one that we can look at. Uh, let's see Pi Network. Let's see if it's there. Of course, Matic. All right, let's do Matic. So if we do Matic, what do we get? We get the Matic Network, which has been rebranded to Polygon. So let's see the first question. Who remembers the first question? Who remembers? The first question would be, Yip, do you remember this time? <laughs> is it public? Is it mainnet? Exactly, guys, exactly. So let's look. It was released in steps and the first step already over a year ago. So yes, next question. What is that one? What is the next question? After mainnet, what is the next one? Tokenomics, yes, allocation. So let's scroll down. Here you also see audits and exploits. If there has been things uh, that are public, then it probably will be found here as well. And governance, also important. So definitely check that out. Here we see from Binance Research. So it had a private seal. It had a launch pet seal. That's like public seal. Team tokens, advisor tokens, network operations. I would say that's company again, foundation, and ecosystem tokens. I would say that's probably the treasury. So if we look at this, we have a private seal a team sale, advisory network, and we have in total like 40% to public and the community. I would say in this case, Matic does not pass. No. Now, what is the next question? Next question. GitHub, code on GitHub. Very good. Here you go. Code can be viewed here. Bam, it is right there. And the last one was last question. Team, very good. I'm very proud of this session everyone is really on their toes so we scroll down you see a lot of information here we have team full team can be viewed right here and the ceo so yes the team is definitely known okay good well done guys i'm uh, impressed everyone is really on top of their game um now i saw a question about what if the project is in beta well if it is in beta, you can already check these things out, but I would personally say be more vigilant, be more prepared to do more research because yes, a beta project means that there could be more errors, could be more bugs. So this is something to be more careful with. The recap. All right, so what are the questions of today? One more time, one more time. I think everyone already knows, but one one's the first one. The first one was du, 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 du. Maynard, Natalie, right there. Very good. Second one, what was that? Tokenomics, yes, the allocation. Great, Anka. And what is the third one? 
open source, exactly. And then team, there we go. Everything is right there. What was the bonus question? Anyone remember? And the use case. Very good, everyone. Very good. So, all right, then I have an assignment for today for all of you. And that is go and do your own research, obviously. And check a project that you heard of, go through these four questions or preferably five, and then ask someone else about a project and check it out and just see if these projects are up to the standard. A question here, will having major investors like Pantera help, for example? It's a very good question, Ash. And I think with private investors, it is really a hit or miss. So some of these private investors like Pantera are really, they can bring value. I would say, for instance, one of them that really has shown this was ARC value, and they really bring connection, et cetera. But there are also other, uh, other private funds or just hedge funds that don't. So it's, it needs more research, basically. If you see there's a large allocation towards private investors, then you want to know who they are. Uh, market cap, certainly in supply. Let's, let's uh, go there in a bit, because first we have some bonus tips on not to get hacked and wrecked, as someone in Telegram channel said. Now, I want to say that I am not a security expert, but I can give you just a quick couple tips. So first one, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And that really is the case with crypto as well. For instance, lately there has been this scam of getting an airdrop that looks like you're having like, whoa, 20K worth of tokens in your wallet. And you're like, what? I got rich overnight. This is awesome. But then when you try to claim it, they take all your stuff in your wallet. So uh, my tip here is just Google the airdrop name plus scam. And you will find a whole list if it's one of those or not. And just with airdrops, be extra careful, just do extra work. Don't immediately think free money because that's just not how life works. Then another one is hardware wallets. So most of you probably have heard about this in the talk of Eleanor and hardware wallets are things like Ledger or Trezor. And what they do is really cool. They give you your seed phrase, like your code to enter your wallet, which Eleanor also talked about, but they create this offline in the hardware wallet itself and it never touches the internet. So that is quite cool because that means that you don't have to, even if you like didn't want to, you're never sharing it with anyone because it's all just only on there. So that's the next point. Never share your sweet phrase, never do it. Never put it online, never put it anywhere because as soon as it touches the internet, it could be anywhere. So never share your seed phrase. It's like, it's like sharing the code to your bank account or your key to your house. Then the fourth one is a little bit more in depth, but I do want to say that this is something that you can do. When you interact with a smart contract, always check the address that you're sending it to with what they have, for instance, on their website or their documentation or their GitHub, or you can go on a block explorer. So just type in Ethereum block explorer or Binance smart chain block explorer or whatever, and you'll find a search tool to go to this. Yeah, CoinGecko also has indeed uh, that you can copy the address of the smart contract. Very good, Ankur. So I would say try different things because it's always possible that the website has been hacked and it's an interface that you're using. The blockchain probably won't get hacked. Like Ethereum getting hacked is quite a small chance, but the interface, like the website of a, of a project or CoinGecko even, that can happen. These are centralized companies. Their security is a very different standard. So check addresses, that is a higher bonus tip, but I do want to mention it. Then another thing, bonus tools, I want to highlight three that I like. Number one is DeFi Safety. This is a project that does reviews of tokens, not necessarily of their fundamentals, like what I do for my work, but more of their code review. And they just check a bunch of, I think, really good standard questions. And they do it for free. It's all 
um, uh, not like it's they don't do things for projects. They do it because they think this is important, and uh, they have over 130 projects reviewed right now. So definitely check it out. And they often do new projects that are a little bit more new. I think they do that because they want to help with people who are just trying things that are not super well known. So another one is actually called Wrecked. It is a news website that uh, talks about how hacks happen. So it's after the fact, but it does give a really cool insight in how these things work and their writing style is just amazing. And another one is also more of a newsletter, which also uh, shows how things have been hacked and what has happened. So perhaps maybe one smart contract has ha hack been hacked in a protocol, but you have pro uh, tokens in another part of it, but then you haven't been like hacked yet, but at least you know like, oh, this project has issues sometimes. I should be more on my toes. So these things I would highly um, advise. So here is the do your own research wiki that you can scan and go towards because aping in is not as cool as doing your own research. Be careful out there. And um, yeah, so I have this pet project, do your own research, but I also understand that it's not for everyone. And that's why I work for a fund that does fundamental research at Cyber Capital. So yeah, that is also something that you have to decide for yourself. Like, is this maybe too much for me or not? But I would still say, try it out before you decide. Always try it out yourself. And uh, time for questions and answers. Yeah, that's it for today. Wow, that's amazing, Seb. <laughs> we can really experience or feel that you've been a teacher in your previous life. Huh? <laughs> yeah, like amazing setup of making us remember, memorize the fundamentals. There were some questions in the chat. Do you want me to read them out? Uh, if I missed them, yes, for sure. Please do. The Chinese tokens, are they researchable? How would one go about checking That's Chinese tokens? a good question. And that is indeed difficult. I would say that even funds are not really clear on how to handle that to a certain extent. I mean, certain projects that are only in Chinese and then there's a Western fund, yeah, that, that is just a barrier. So, I mean, this is a problem, but I would say if a Chinese project gets to a certain standard that it's good enough, then, and that's the awesome thing of this open source community world, then there will be people who start to translate it. So then uh, sooner or later you will find guides and it will be a bit more easy. Yeah, thanks. How about market cap circulating supply in these kind of cape? Yeah. yeah I, I think one of the major misconceptions maybe you can share about it is like the token price versus the market cap a lot of people who enter the crypto market look at the bias. price <laughs> yes that's indeed something that is a real thing it's called unit bias it means that if a token is let's say it costs 0 0.0001 cents per token then a lot of people are like oh this token is cheap and bitcoin is expensive but then if you look at how many tokens there are like Bitcoin has 18, no, 21 million at the end. And some of these tokens like Ripple, they have like hundreds of millions. So yeah, then sure, the token might seem cheaper, but is it really if you calculate with the full uh, token distribution? No, I would say with market cap, if you look at things like that, this is a different game. Then you're talking more about like, is this the right time to step in because, hey, the market cap is already high and have I missed the boat and stuff like that. That's more of a trading mindset, which today is more of fundamentals. And I would say that when you really believe in the fundamentals of the use case and like the whole setup of this project, then is it ever the, the, the wrong time? I mean, then if you really believe in it, just go for it, I would say. And I also think that this is, for most people, a better way of doing it because then you get more of a really, um, a, a way of investing that you trust the research that you've done instead of that you're becoming a trader, which is really a, a different type of ball game. Not everyone is good at traders, at, at trading and even technical analysis. I mean, a lot of people say in the end, 
it's basically a coin flip. So yeah, I wouldn't advise that to people. Yeah, fair point. There was a question regarding how would you go about to check, like to proof check the tokenomics? How would proof one find tokens. out that, <laughs> you know, what they claim yeah, yeah, in the white paper is actually yeah, real? Yeah. yeah, very good. So one of the reasons I put mainnet first is because that means that you already can check on blockchain explorers if something is really there or not. So then you can see on a blockchain explorer how many tokens are there because the blockchain won't lie. It's open, it's out there. So for instance, a project that actually ran into issues with this is Solana, which a lot of people forgot by now, but when Solana started and it's on the wiki, you can read it, uh, they lied about the initial token uh, supply. And then when they went live, people were like, hey, on the blockchain explorer, I just see that you have an, an extra portion of a couple million extra tokens. Well, what's up with this? I would say that's really, really uncool. That's a red flag. Yeah. How would you go about looking at blockchains where, you know, blockchains that are not decentralized yet? Um, could you specify that a little bit more? I mean, well, let's say the, the blockchain Solana, everybody could launch a blockchain, okay. right? Yeah, I see. <laughs> and I then, see. of course, they can change it, like whatever yeah. they want to validate on it. Yeah. So with blockchains that are, for instance, they still have a very low validator set. Yes. So for instance, uh, I would say Avalanche and Ethereum have quite a high validator set. And so validators is the same thing as like a full node or just a node. So these are software that check transactions. And with some projects, they are built in a way that they don't have a lot of validators. This is called DPoS, uh, Delegated Proof of Stake. Then they have like a couple of super nodes. This means there's more throughput, uh, so you can do more transactions faster, but you lose out on decentralization. So if there's a low validator set, well, that's in my book, just less decentralized. So if you really believe that they will change this and they say they will change it, and you can see in their actions that they are working towards it, well, then it's up to you to take the risk and take that step. But it is something to really, be more careful with, yeah. Yeah, it's always good to bear in mind in which stage of the um, rollout this project is, and then thereby yes. there's more information or less information Indeed. available, and obviously upside downsides are um, also This is different. also something that next week in the DAO conversation, I will also talk about like, where are we with DAOs? Because blockchain is now around since 2000, eight, nine, but DAOs have been around for a couple of years. And I would say with DAOs, for instance, like really cool use case, but it's so early. It's really early. So yeah, you have to be more careful if you go through, if you try to invest in purely the DAO use case. Yeah, that's very early stage. Well, thank you very much. You already made the bridge to next week. We have Zev again. <laughs> For, um, who will share the basics of how to look at DAOs, what do DAO mean, what is their market opportunity or even their use case opportunity. So thank you all and for how to join them today. How to join them too, yes, yes. how to actually bring democracy to the ecosystem. <laughs> and sorry Yip, to interrupt, I will say, I see a bunch more questions, just uh, copy them and send them in the Telegram chat. I will be there for another half an hour or so answering questions there. All right, thank you everyone. And then also tomorrow we have a speaker session live mentoring with Christopher May from Finoa, one of the leading digital asset custodians here in Europe. Um, hope to see many of you there too. And of course we'll share the recordings for those who can't make it live. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget to fill the survey and Zeb is there to answer any questions in the Telegram chat. Exactly. Talk soon bye, everyone. Bye.